Hey everybody, it's Kay Farrar and uh, we are here continuing our conversation and I'm calling this conversation today, Separation Anxiety. We're actually talking about the separation of church and state. And the more I began to look at some of the issues and things that we are seeing, it made me sort of um, think and scratch my head a little bit more, you know, uh, and that's where I came up with the thought of separation anxiety. If you look at what's going on in our country, um, I was looking at some numbers, you know, it's, it's all relative and depends on when they're pulled and who pulled them. This is from Statistica, uh, which is well known uh, in terms of data. And they looked at the number of homicide victims from all G7 countries. And so that includes Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, United Kingdom, and United States. And uh, the homicide rate in the United States, it is by far in a way so much higher than any of the other countries that we listed, right? Um, also, the number of mass shootings in the United States. If you take all of the other countries, what they call developed countries, they didn't use G7 here, this is still Statistica, and add them up all together in all the developing countries or developed countries, our rate is about the same as all of them put together. Um, and just on so many measures that we look at, um, whether it's, you know, the divorce rate, I looked at their uh, stats on countries with the lowest divorce rate and we weren't even on a list. So that's telling you, we don't have one of the lowest ones. And the more I began to think about this concept of separation of church and state, if we are the light of the world, right? Um, and, you know, there are more Christians that live in the United States than anywhere else. So are some of these uh, ways of thinking um, is not in the Constitution, separation of church and state. It does not exist in the Constitution, that phrase, by the way. But some of these um, ways that govern how we interact as a church, as believers, I just began to wonder how much of that is really God's will. How much of that is his intent for the church, for the body of Christ to be separate, right? from anybody if we're the light of the world and is it almost like doing that to the effectiveness of the church because you know the bible lets us know that we are the light of the world and if we have the highest concentration of christians anywhere in the united states are we here but not lit, as that expression goes? Are we not letting our light shine? In a sense, is it almost like we've been muzzled? <laughs> We're here, but we got our light under a bushel and we got our lip zipped. And so that just led me to wanna do a little bit of digging. And so that we're gonna look at it today from the standpoint of uh, a couple things. One thing we're gonna look at is actually Looking at some of the founding documents for this country, what did they intend when they started the colonies, all right? And so, and just as a, as a real quick introduction, right? Because I know you all may have paid as much attention as I did in school. Some of these things we need to go back and take another look at. Um, but of course, we have 1607, when Jamestown was settled. Here's a little bit of what that ship looked like that came over, right? All the way back in 1607. Um, but they sent about 100 people over and the purpose 
was commerce. They were sent by the Virginia Company of England uh, for trade purposes, to start a new colony, uh, for trading of goods and things from England, for raising crops. And so, um, but let's look at some of the wording that they used when they came over. And so I have several historical documents um, and I'm going to read you an excerpt. I'm not going to read the whole thing, okay? But I'm going to read you excerpts from some of these early documents relating to the founding of our country, all right? So the first Virginia Charter, and I want to, um, we're going to go into a little bit more behind that, but let's look at um, an excerpt from this first Virginia Charter. The providence of Almighty God hereafter tend to the glory of his divine majesty in propagating of Christian religion to such people as yet live in darkness. So this is an excerpt from the first Virginia Charter talking about spreading the gospel. The next piece I want to read a bit from is from the Mayflower Compact. You know, all of the leaders who uh, were party to the compact. And it says in the second paragraph, having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith and honor of our king and country. And it's talking about, you know, England. Um, and then it goes on to talk about being able to uh, combine ourselves together in a civil body politic, right? So it refers to politics. It refers to uh, assembling together for the good of all. But it also says, having undertaken this for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith. So it was a part of the mission. And you can see the names of the people uh, who signed that Mayflower Compact. The mindset about how things were supposed to go. Uh, and we know, you know, we got to maintain our Christianity. And that's another thing we need to talk about. It's another thing to believe is, and then it's a completely different thing to walk it out and to really walk in love. And the piece that I'm mentioning that for is because we all know uh, that as they began to prosper and begin to plant crops, they found that they needed some labor and that's when they went to Africa and brought uh, enslaved people to work for free, which is not of God, not godly. Uh, and we see the residual of that even still today, right? But what I want to go back to was what was the original intent? And we know that everybody that came over did not go down that dark and evil path of slavery. I'm going to call it that. Right. And so with that, um, let's go back to the concept of the pilgrims. All right. Now, the pilgrims um, is the group that came over on the Mayflower and um, just some kind of background on that. That was in 1620. England was a Roman Catholic nation. Uh, up until the reign of King Henry VIII, you know, per this per this research, right? And it was King Henry VIII that declared himself the head, the King of England declared himself the head of a new national church called the Church of England. So even the governmental origin that predated the pilgrims coming here 
and um, even the ships coming to Jamestown, the head of state and the head of church were one and the same. And that was ingrained uh, in how they ran their government. Isn't that interesting? Uh, but as we go on, what happened was there were people, believers, Christians called Puritans, who felt like the Church of England was still too much like the Roman Catholic Church. And they wanted to worship more freely, uh, more organically, more like the early Christians than, than the Church of England or the Catholic Church. And so they were called Puritans because they felt like the Church of England needed to be purified. That's where that came from. Isn't that interesting? But then there were other believers who were a little bit more intense, more radical, and they felt that the Church of England was too far gone and it couldn't be purified. And so they were called separatists because they believed that they needed to be totally separate from either one of them, the Roman Catholic Church or the Church of England. And so um, they were persecuted. It was illegal to, um, and, you know, and dangerous and everything else to be part of any church other than the Church of England in England. They still wanted to be English people, but they just did not uh, want to bow down to their way of worship. And so they actually left and, and um, went to the Dutch and lived there for a while. And then when the opportunity came to leave there because there was some oppression in terms of their labor, because I guess they were foreigners and, and that kind of thing. They decided to come to the quote unquote, uh, new colony in America. Right. And so they were the pilgrims that came to Plymouth rock. That's the short version of it. Again, you guys can um, take a look at it, but we can see coming from that background of wanting to be purified or separate and to be free to worship that was ingrained, all right, in the founding of our country. And so going back to separation anxiety, I believe, right, I, and I, I'm thinking you believe this too, that the word of God is the answer for everything. The spirit of God is the answer for everything. Um, it's a walk. It's a work. We have to work out our own salvation, right, with fear and trembling. But it's worth it. And I would say that being that we are a predominantly, the most predominant, Christian uh, nation in the world, I think we need to begin the process of thinking differently. Now, uh, one of the things I do also want to mention is that the concept of separating the state as, as years went on and the constitution was written and people began to govern and just like, you know, with the Israelites, you have people who pursue the faith and stay with the faith. And then you have people who fall away and become more secular, right? And so we've always had that. And then you have that capitalistic vein as well, which can pull people um, away. It can, it doesn't have to, right? But it can. And so the concept of uh, the separation of church and state, if we uh, look at some more of the research, and once again, you guys, we've had so much fun, we're out of time, but we're going to post some of it. But if you look at the additional research, one of the early Christian ministers said that there should be a wall, okay, once governance began between the government and the church meaning that the government should not be allowed to dictate or legislate or interfere in any way with anyone's ability to worship 
freely, meaning that there should be no constraints. And so I submit to you that there is an aspect of this concept of church and state that we have today that's a little bit off and not what anyone intended it to be. Um, the reference that led to that phrase was really intended to protect the church from being infringed upon and or controlled by government, which can be corrupt. All right. A whole different way of thinking about it. A whole different way of thinking about it for me. I would encourage us to think differently about being engaged. We are the light of the world. There's a way to do everything. There's a way to say everything. What we don't want to do is walk around muzzled. Pull that tape off. Give the word. Preach the word in season and out of season. Be the light of the world. Be the salt of the earth. Let's figure out ways where we can be part of every solution, including solutions that are needed in our schools, solutions that are needed in our city councils, solutions that are needed in our board of supervisors, our state houses, house, senate, um, all aspects of government. And let Christians begin to stand up, begin to be counted, begin to help change the tide because we have the answer and we know Jesus is that answer. Let's be led by the spirit, but let's not shy away from getting involved in government. All right, that's our podcast today. We'll catch you again next time.